Thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, today will be a, another one of our regional updates from one of the CEM regions. This month, it'll be from West Africa. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to type them into the chat, but we will address those at the end. Uh, but today we'll be on the topic of ecological restoration in West Africa, accomplishments, challenges, and opportunities presented by Abraham X. Barusi, lecturer from Nigeria Maritime University. So just a little bit of housekeeping here, and if to anybody who haven't been on this webinar series before, um, every month we give a 40 to 50 minute presentation um, from <clears throat> uh, global initiatives, strategic planning, technical uh, practice issues, or regional updates from around the globe, all in the context of restoration. We hope that this webinar series uh, provides a nice forum for others uh, around the world, whether in the CEM, IUCN, um, or restoration practitioners or researchers to connect and uh, share and get to know each other. Um, we hold this every third Friday of the month uh, from 12 to 1 Eastern time. And um, uh, next slide, please. And as I mentioned, this is open to all CEM members. Uh, we hope to grow participation every month. And uh, once you register, you remain registered for the entire series. So that same link you use today will be the same one you use in all future um, sessions. You can go to the Ecosystem Restoration Webinar Series webpage, and you will find a link to all the presentation PowerPoints, as well as a link to the YouTube um, videos for each one. Um, but I also have a, a direct link to the playlist on YouTube, uh, which I include in all reminder emails and invite emails. Um, it takes a little bit longer for us to get them onto the actual IUCN website, but I can put them on the YouTube playlist at any time, and I hope to have this one available to you uh, within a week. So um, if you missed anything or you want to pass it on to a friend. If anybody's interested in joining the Commission on Ecosystem Management, uh, please email myself or Kara. We provide those. I'll provide those in the chat, but those are also in all of our communications. Um, it's a very simple process. It uh, is basically uh, filling out a form and sending in a resume. And I just, uh, just want to see that you are truly interested in, in, in have an experience in conservation and, um, ecos or in, in ecosystem management. So uh, without further ado, I will introduce Abraham. Um, he is from the, Mar the Nigeria Maritime University, and uh, we're very happy to have him here today. He's going to give a nice overview of uh, everything in restoration, what's going on in his CEM region. And uh, I figure, Abraham, you can introduce yourself better than I can. So I will pass this off to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Brooke. Um, good day, everyone. Thank you for having me. And uh, as he has said, I'm Ibrahim Ibirisi, a lecturer from the Nigeria Maritime University, and also a doctoral student at the World Bank African Center of Excellence in Oil Fit Chemical Research, University of Port Harcourt. And uh, basically, my research area is into remediation and restoration of polluted environments climate change, ecological disaster risk management. And there uh, has been said by the summary uh, regarding myself, I'm a member of the IUCN Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group and also the Society for Ecological Restoration. And today we'll be looking at uh, ecological restoration in West Africa, the accomplishment challenges and opportunity. This presentation, it's like an overview of restoration activities in the sub-region. And uh, today we'll look at environmental issues in West Africa, restoration initiatives, achievement of the various restoration programs, challenges, and also opportunities present in the sub-region. Now introduction, background issue to West Africa, as you can see from the map at the corner of the presentation, the West Africa is found in the western most region of Africa, comprised of 17 countries, 
and the area cover one fifth of the African continent. And uh, it's bounded by the west, and in the west and the south by the Atlantic Ocean, in the north by the encroaching Sahara Desert, and in the east by Cameroon and Lake Chad. It has an estimated population of 391 million people. The climate it has three major climatic uh, zones. We have the tropical forest, the dry forest, and the savanna belts. And the forest resources have a total volume of forest that is about 5 billion cubic meters, which uh, consists of 13% of the total forest cover of the continent and 2% of the forest cover of the world. And uh, based on the assessment, this uh, information, the forest resources information, is coming from assessment of the FAO done in 2000. I think that's the most recent information available. And uh, Guinea Bissau is the most forested country, while the least forested in the region is Mauritania. All right, environmental issues in the region, in the region include desertification, declining water resources as seen in Lake Chad, deforestation or forest degradation, pollution, especially from the petrochemical industry, flooding and coastal erosion. And uh, these issues, the major drivers include rapid population growth and economic development, climate change, lack of adequate framework for resources management, lack of legal rights of indigenous people and conflict in some regions. Now we'll look at each of the environmental issues properly. Um, like I mentioned, the certification covers, dryland covers 65% of the African continent and it's estimated to be occurring at about 20,000 hectares per year. And presently, 319 million hectares are vulnerable to desertification due to sand movement from the Sahara Desert. Now in the West African region, the certification is estimated to be occurring at a rate of five kilometers per year. And this is fueling food insecurity, forced migration, civil unrest, and in some cases, extremism in some of the countries in the region. For example, in Nigeria, it has been estimated that the desert encroachment is happening about one meter per year and is affecting about 35% of the total land mass of the country, which costs across 11 states, and threatening the economic livelihood of over 40 to 50 million people. Now, declining water resources are seen in Lake Chad. The lake is located in North Central Africa. It covers 8% of the continent and spread across seven countries. The lake provides fishery resources water for irrigation and other domestic use to over 30 million people. And sadly, the lake shrunk about 90% within the past um, 60 to 80 years. As you can see from the figure at the right-hand side of the presentation, the lake shrinking started significantly from 1986 and uh, you can see from the figure the shrinking has been very very significant coming to 2018 and the population as the area is projected to increase by 50 million increase to 50 million sorry by 2020 and the decline of the lake is also creating security crisis around the chart basin Forest degradation and deforestation. The West African region is reported to have one of the highest deforestation rates in the world. And about 90% of the forest has been degraded, heavily fragmented, and destroyed. Now, the drivers of deforestation in the sub-region include agriculture. And here we have two major cash crops, the oil palm and the cocoa plantation. We remember in January 2015, the African section of the Society for Conservation Biology brought out a position paper calling on regional governments and the oil palm producers to work holistically in order to see reduction in threats to biodiversity from oil palm plantation. 
And also one of the other major driver is fuel wood and charcoal. About 70% of the population in some of these countries rely on fuel wood and charcoal for their domestic use. And also we have excessive logging or, and also illegal logging. And one of the most uh, affected species, the rosewood, which is commonly called coso in West Africa, is one of the most trafficked species in the world. It's reported to be trafficked more than rhinos, angolins, and other um, species found in the region. And in 2015, about 2015, 2016, 61% of rosewood that was imported to China came from West Africa. As you can see from the pictures in this presentation, the picture below the third picture show fine furnitures created from rosewood imported from West Africa. Now, due to the series of um, uh, excessive logging that is happening in the region, efforts have been made, like for example, the Nigerian government succeeded in listing the rosewood into the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species in 2016. Uh, we hope that with this uh, listing, it will reduce the deforestation rate of um, the rosewood. As you can see from this map, the purple region from 1975, the purple region represents the areas where we have natural forests in the sub-region. And moving from 1975 to 2013, you can see a decline in the purple region, while the green, the green uh, shaded areas represent woodland. But as we move to 2013, you can see a decline in the green areas and the purple areas, which is uh, replaced with yellowish and reddish um, uh, coloration. The yellow is basically agriculture, irrigated and non-irrigated agriculture, as I've said before, from the intense cash crop from oil and the cocoa plantation. Why the red areas indicate settlement, increase urbanization, um, that has been uh, occurring in the sub-region. A look at pollution. In 2017, the World Bank um, made an assessment in four countries of the sub-region and reported that pollution of air, water, and waste uh, cost about 1.4 billion in the four countries. And uh, that is an issue of concern and to the region. Also, the petrochemical pollution, for example, in Nigeria, over five decades of oil exploration, sorry, has resulted in extensive pollution of the Niger Delta region. And two international assessments has uh, laid this to rest, like the natural assessment damage in 2006 by Professor Emmanuel Boat of the Nigerian Conservation Foundation and other experts from the US and the UK indicated that the region is one of the most polluted region in the world. Also, the UNEP assessment report that was released in 2011 indicated extensive damage of Ogoni land and called for emergency response in the region. Now, we also have issue of coastal flooding and erosion in West Africa, which affects over 500 people yearly across the sub-region, leading to loss of life destruction of property worth billions of dollars. And also, based on the World Bank estimate, also considering issues of erosion and flooding, indicated that uh, the region lost 3.4 billion per year as a result of um, flooding and coastal erosion. And one of the most significant flooding in the sub-region occurred in 2012, which affected, for example, in Nigeria, 23 states out of the 36 states, displacing over 2.1 million people killing hundreds and destroying of over half a million homes. Now the restoration initiative, here we'll looking at five uh, initiative, three that is based in the sub-region and two that is based in Nigeria. Now there are other restoration initiative, you know, found in the sub-region, but I've decided to focus on these five in the course of this presentation. And the first is the Green Wall for the Sahara and the Sahel Initiative. It was conceived in 20, 2002, I beg your pardon, it was conceived in 2002 and launched by the African Union in 2007. 
Originally, the idea is just about planted trees across the region, the Sahel, Sahara region. But later, it was upgraded to combat desertification, climate change, and reduce poverty. The concept is to build a wall that is 15 kilometers thick and about 8,000 kilometers long from Senegal to Djibouti across the continent. And uh, the goal is to restore 100 million hectares of degraded land by 2030, create 10 million jobs, and absorb 250 million tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. And the cost was put at 8 billion for the project. Now, also, the project is envisaged to reduce, to help to facilitate sustainable development goal. Go one, we talk about poverty, go two, hunger, go five, gender equality, go six, clean water and sanitation, go seven, clean and affordable energy, go eight, decent work, go 13, climate action, and 15, we talk about life on land. And countries and partners, over 20 countries in North and West Africa are part of this project. Y22 regional international partners are also part of this project. The regional strategy was drafted in 2012 and was approved by the African Union in 2013. And in December 2015, world leaders at COP21 pledged about $5 billion in an effort to aid the Green Wall Initiative. Secondly, we have the African Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative. It was launched also in COP21, at COP21 in Paris, December 2015. And the project contributes to the Bond Challenge, the Global uh, Forest Landscape Restoration Challenge, and SDG Go 15, which talks about life on land. And the goal is also to bring about 100 million hectares of land in Africa into restoration by 2030. And when it was conceived, about 26 countries committed over 91 million hectares of land as part of their pledge for restoration. And the cost was put at $1 billion. Now, according to the step-by-step -step plan for the implementation, the starting phase is supposed to take about three to nine months. Then you jump to the implementation stage and finally to and finally, to the large scale like implementation at large scale. As you can see from the African map, you can see the, the commitment and pledges of different African countries as May 2018. Lake Shad Basin Commission it was established in May 1964 by four countries, and the goal is the ecological restoration of Lake Shad. And the funding initially is provided by member countries on our grid quota. Now, over time, other countries within the region has also joined the Lake Shad Basin Commission. Now, we have the hydrocarbon pollution remediation projects. Due to agitation of the Niger Delta region after the UNEP report was released, the federal government established the hydrocarbon pollution remediation projects under the Federal Ministry of Environment in 2015, and the goal is the restoration of Ogoni land and other affected crude oil polluted areas in the Niger Delta. It was launched by the Vice President in June 2016 in Bodo, one of the heavily impacted communities in River State. And the initial funding for takeoff was uh, given at uh, 200 million for the funding of the project. Also, another restoration initiative in Nigeria, we have the Nigeria Erosion and Watershed Management Project, which is from the World Bank, established in September 2013. It's an eight-year pro project to finance state-led intervention to prevent and reverse land degradation, particularly gully erosion. And the funding basically was from the World Bank, the Global Environment Facility, and the Special Climate Fund. Now look at the achievement of this restoration program highlighted. A great green wall for the Sahara and Sahel Initiative. Um, some countries have made efforts to restore some level of degraded lands. 
and uh, Ethiopia have been reported to restore 15 million hectares of degraded land and improve land tenure security. Nigeria is reported to have restored 5 million hectares of degraded land and created about 20,000 jobs. Niger Republic is reported to restore 5 million hectares of degraded land, while Burkina Faso has restored 3 million hectares of degraded land. Senegal has restored 25,000 hectares by planting 11 to 12 million trees, while Sudan has restored 2,000 hectares of land. As of, of March 2019, 15% of the wall of the Great Green Wall is set to be completed. Now, the African Landscape Restoration. As part of efforts, three annual partners meetings have been held. The first was in Ethiopia in 2016, the second was in Nigeria Republic, and the third was in October in Kenya 2018. And from the initial 26 countries in Africa that pledged 91 million hectares for restoration, the countries that have made pledges have increased to 28 countries across Africa, pledging 113 million hectares of uh, land earmarked for restoration. Now, the Lakeshad Basin Commission uh, has put in spirited efforts working with Ramsar International to designate the Lake Shad region as a transboundary Ramsar site of international importance. That was done in 2000, and also working with UNESCO to designate the area as a World Natural Heritage Site, which was done in 2012. Now, funding for most of the activities of the Lake Shad Basin Commissions comes from the World Bank, the German International Development Corporation, and China. And uh, most of the funding goes towards capacity development on climate change, traditional and modern agriculture within the sub-region, and also effort to restore peace, security, and sustainable development. So China funded an interbasin water transfer project, which look at the feasibility of diverting water from the Congo River and some other rivers into the Lake Shad Basin. As part of achievements of HyPREP, HyPREP has carried out some medical intervention in affected communities, like for instance, in LMA, in Bodo, doing eye checkup, uh, general medical uh, uh, intervention for community members in Ogoni land. And also efforts have been made to implement water projects. And they significantly, um, they've completed their first phase of the contracting process and uh, over 21, I think about around 21 contractors have been mobilized to the four local governments, heavily impacted local governments in river states, LMA, Thai, Kana, and Gukana for the restoration and remediation activities. And now for new map, initially many states were skeptical about um, embracing new map when it was launched. Only seven states were able to participate at the initial phase. And uh, due to the success of the first phase, 12 other states indicated interest to be part of the program. And so far, new map has been able to significantly uh, make effort to reduce gully erosion in states where they have um, projects um, that have been implemented. Now I'll consider some of the challenges of uh, ecological restoration in the region. Now the first challenge I consider is the lack of political will. Uh, most projects are government initiated or lean heavily on governments. And for that, they require strong political leadership to succeed. And uh, most time if the political leadership or leaders of the nation are not basically interested in restoration projects, then most likely um, everything about restoration would go underground or be silenced. That's why sometimes there is delay from conception to implementation of some of these restoration projects or initiatives. Also, we have challenge of uh, inadequate funding in many of the countries of the sub-region, budgetary allocations are small and inefficient because there are a lot of items or sectors that require funding. 
And many inter initiatives rely on pledges from ward leaders that may have certain conditions. Sometimes some of the pledges by ward leaders in some of these international forums are never remitted to the countries that needed the resources. Also high economic costs of restoration. Of course, some of the intervention are expensive and uh, because of the cost or the need to execute other projects, like I've said in other sectors, funding become an issue due to the high cost of a restoration program. Also, we have lack of adequate legal and regulatory framework among state level players. There is weak policy laws and regulations in many countries of the sub region and no adequate framework for restoration projects for the Green Wall and the African Restoration Initiative. For instance, in Nigeria, although the activities of the Green Wall started in 2013, the agency or the legal backing for that uh, initiative was initiated in 2015, and the Senate passed the B in October 2016. And uh, many countries in the region do not have the legal framework supporting some of the restoration initiative, hence efforts to make budgetary allocations or to, or to put in sufficient funds for restoration um, do not really scale through. Also, we have transition from pledges to implementation as part of the major issue that hovers around the third annual partnership meeting in Kenya of the African landscape restoration issue was the issue of transition from pledges to implementation. You know, so much pledges have been made, but uh, effort, uh, effort regarding uh, significant implementation of the landscape, um, sorry, the restoration initiative, it's not really flying to say there is no significant improvement or effort on ground to match the pledges that have been made over time or since 2015. Also have ineffective monitoring and evaluation components. Their reported sources are difficult to measure. You know, the various sources that have been reported by different countries, sometimes they are difficult to measure. And for the Green War, it has been estimated that 10 million hectares of land is needed to be restored every year to meet the restoration target by 2030. And the question is, what is the contribution of each country towards achieving the target? Um, there is no effort towards that extent and say, so, okay, each country towards this green wall should make at least restore a particular or a specific uh, hectares or how did, was it um, distributed to get the restoration target between 3030? Also, that is also an issue. is not um, is not clearly or properly uh, uh, stated out or executed in that line. Also, have several tree planting campaign, and uh, sometimes we don't know the tree planting campaign which is which. Is it part of the Green Wall? Is it part of the African Restoration Landscape Initiative? For example, on July 19, 2019, the Ethiopian Prime Minister uh, announced that over 353 million trees were planted as part of the Green Legacy Program. Uh, the question is, is that part of the, the Green Wall? Is that part of the African Landscape Restoration Project? Is it part of a national plan? Does it align with any of the restoration initiatives in the sub-region? So these are also issues that um, are not too clear. All right, we also have the Ogoni cleanup, which has no restoration plan after remediation. I'm saying this because when the cleanup started, I made effort to contact the Federal Minister of Environment to get the work plan or the concept, the cleanup concept, because if you search the website of High Prep or the Federal Minister of Environment, there's no schedule, there's no work plan, there's no timeline about how the cleanup is going to be implemented. Although UNEP um, indicated that the cleanup of Ogoni land would take about 30 years to, to, to achieve, but um, 
so far, since high prep have started, we cannot assess any work plan or any direction on how the remediation is going to go. Why this is important? Because we need to find out after remediation what next, because it is titled as ecological restoration of Ogoni land. And we know in cases of remediation in the Ninja data, when there is an oil spill, the oil industry or the spiller hire a contractor to come and clean or remediate the land. And after remediation, the contractor and the spiller or the oil company invite the regulator to assess the land and do some assessment to see that, okay, the land has been remediated. And after that, everybody smiles and go happily. What now happened after remediating the land? Is the land going to be restored or regenerated to support the previous ecosystem that was in the land? And in most cases, we've seen that most time when the remediation is completed, the land is left bare. That's why you have series of uh, invasive species prevalent in the Niger Delta. Most prominent among them is the Nifia palm. So I also want to know, and I'm sure many scientists are interested in the Ogoni Restoration uh, uh, Initiative because it will take a very long duration and affected a very large area. Is it going to be just remediation or after remediation, there's going to be some efforts to restore um, the forested areas and the uh, had the intent to go about that, it's good that um, some of those information are made available. And also, we also have lack of collaboration, stroke linkages. Um, find out that there's no link between restoration science and restoration initiatives in the region. And uh, also from my little uh, um, uh, um, understanding, there's no strong background in science and research on restoration. Science is not adequately incorporated into restoration projects. And if you look at the schools, for example, I look at universities in Nigeria, where we have about 79 private universities, 48 state universities, and 43 federal investees in all the undergraduate programs and the postgraduate programs there's no standalone restoration program in the investees same way when i look at lejon university in ghana there is no also restoration program the closest we have is a program that had to do with environmental management environmental science and the agriculture uh, afforestation I think that's the closest that we have. So there's no strong link between the restoration policy, the practice, local knowledge and research. There's no synergy and link between restoration initiative in the sub-region. And uh, what are the opportunities as we move into the decade of restoration? I believe this is an opportunity for the sub-region to increase efforts towards restoration of degraded environments. And also, I want to believe that uh, West Africa has a very high level of youthful population. As we have seen, some of the youth are those driving the SDG programs in the region. And it's estimated that 20 million uh, job seekers are expected to enter into the market within the next 15 years. I believe that um, for the restoration decade, if we can tap into the youthful population in terms of training and uh, other areas, we can increase the restoration efforts in the sub-region. And also, there is need for the establishment of centers of excellence in ecosystem restoration, like uh, the current uh, World Bank African Centers of Excellence we have in Africa, where the World Bank established about 20 centers of excellence, depending on the capacity of each centers in terms of technical capacity and competence. So I also believe that if we have center of excellence in ecosystem restoration, it can help to accelerate restoration efforts in the region. Also, if, we, if not centers of excellence, it can also be 
ecosystem restoration programs in universities, ecological restoration, ecosystem restoration, established under science faculties or agri faculties that will help to train and develop capacities in this area to also facilitate and accelerate restoration science and practice in the sub-region. Also, the role of societies and NGOs in restoration need to come alive in the sub-region. There is no strong presence of the Society for Ecological Restoration. I know few, few of us from this region in Nigeria, I can't precisely say for other African countries, are members of the Society for Ecological Restoration. But in Nigeria, we don't have any society or association that have to do with ecological restoration. And I'm also sure from my little search, there is um, none in some of these uh, West African countries. So there is need for societies and NGOs that support restoration to come alive and have strong presence in the region to also push efforts towards restoration activities in the region. Okay, um, in my conclusion, I said we must make concrete achievement within a decade of restoration, then there should be strong policy framework for ecological restoration, including restoration standards. Um, so far from the little I can gather from the restoration initiative, there is no strong framework supporting restoration activities in most of the West African countries. There is no standard. And most time, the practice rely on local uh, um, knowledge and from uh, activities of um, forestation research. But um, it is good that we have a strong policy framework for ecological restoration, restoration standard to guide the practice in the sub-region. Also, science needs to come alive, the science of uh, ecological restoration or ecosystem restoration. There is need for strong synergy between the practice and science in the region. You know, it would be good for researchers and scientists to do independent assessments of this restoration project, because over time in West Africa and Africa per se, we've been planting trees for several decades. There have been different initiative and campaigns to plant trees at one time or the other. And uh, so far, they've not been really serious research efforts to look at why some of these initiatives do not succeed and what are the major challenges that are affecting the success of these initiatives so that um, they could be a way to build on you know, the ones that are succeeding and why the efforts that is hampering the success could be avoided in subsequent uh, restoration efforts. So there is a need for the science to come alive and there are more people to be trained in this area of, of, um, of research. I'm very confident that uh, many youth in West Africa are interested um, if the program and the uh, resources are available to do that. Also, we need to learn lessons from successful restoration program in other regions. It's very, very important that uh, as the restoration initiatives are ongoing, there's need to learn lessons. I know from the Southern African region, there have been some success in restoration activities. And also from the Western world, we need to learn some of the successful restoration program and if they can be adapted to the restoration initiative and efforts in the sub-region. And also there is need for increased support from international organizations, um, financial institutions, especially the World Bank, the Global Environment Facility, and expert organizations, sometimes not just financial support, we need capacity building and training efforts. Uh, from the IUCN, the Society for Ecological Restoration, and other relevant restoration association organization to increase the knowledge and expertise of restoration science and practice in the sub-region. 
Also, like I said before, budgets allocation from many of these countries um, are tight and uh, there are many items on the budget list demanding funds. So limited funds are made available for restoration projects. I know for Nigeria, um, the Green Wall is normally funded from the ecological funds. But sometimes you, there are stories in the news where money from the ecological funds is being used for other areas outside ecological intervention. So there are, many of these countries have a, a shortage of finance and pressing needs where issues of restoration becomes not too high on the priority list of governments. And also, I said that the success of various restoration programs will help improve security. Of course, as seen in many regions, there's conflict and extremism as a result of shortage of resources from the impact of degraded forests where people livelihood are affected and also from the encroaching desert where resources are becoming scarce is creating a, creating a conflict and a security situation. So the success of the various restoration program uh, can help to improve security, combat climate change, reduce forced migration, improve forest management. And thank you very much for your audience. Thank you very much, Abraham. That was a very thorough introduction to what's going on in, in West Africa. We really appreciate your, your time today to talk with us. Thank um, you very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions um, for, for Abraham that you'd like him to address to, um, to expand upon, please type them into the chat and we'll get to those. Um, before we do that, I just want to introduce uh, what we're going to be talking about next month. Um, I think maybe that next slide will take us there. Okay. All right. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so November 15th, uh, we're going to have a webinar on tech, uh, of the theme of technical guidance. We've done a couple of these before. This time it's going to be presented by Thomas Kay. He's the founder and executive director for the Institute of Applied Ecology. And he's going to be talking about um, emerging issues and collecting appropriate native plants for ecosystem restoration. And uh, I know a, a few colleagues who are involved in this, and they're really excited to uh, hear him talking about this topic. So uh, please remember to uh, mark your calendars, uh, same link, um, on November 15th for next month. That'd be great. Uh, and also, if you direct yourself to the chat. Um, there's a small three question survey about um, this webinar series. So uh, please take just a moment to fill it out. Uh, it really helps us uh, understand what you'd like to have us include in future webinar sessions. So uh, without further ado, um, please uh, type your questions into the chat and we'll get to them uh, as we can. Uh, for Abraham, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Abraham, this is Kara, and congratulations on an excellent presentation that was so informative. I really appreciate your taking the time to put it together. Thank you um, very while much. While others are um, putting their thoughts together for a question, um, I have a, a comment and then um, a question if um, there's time. And my comment is, or maybe it is actually a question whether or not these data have been summarized for the restoration community in terms of a short paper for restoration ecology or another outlet reporting on what's going on in the region. I've seen several articles like that that have been really useful, most recently a paper on bottlenecks for restoration from Chile. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I think so far there is no summarize um, a report um, on the restoration efforts in the region. Although they, it's possible there is, but um, in my search, I've not come across 
and a summary reports on restoration efforts in the region. Well, the I, I think exactly what you presented would be really useful to write up as a short kind of commentary piece for restoration ecology if you have time in your schedule. Okay, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. Awesome. Okay, so I have a question, but I'll hold it because I see Gordon is asking, is there a mechanism in West Africa whereby the movement of invasive plant species is being monitored? Um, so the best of my knowledge, I don't think, I don't think there is, I don't think so. I know there are, there are researchers working on invasive species, but um, I don't really think that um, there's a comprehensive effort or um, aggregate efforts to look into that. I don't think so. Okay, thank you. So I'll throw in my question now. One thing that really struck me from your presentation was the um, lack of um, connectedness among different initiatives. Okay. And I think that's a trend that we have seen that has been really problematic across the globe. Okay. And now we have the UN decade, but we also have these different UN conventions like um, climate change and, you know, biodiversity. Can you comment on whether you think these sort of siloed conventions is a problem or part of the problem um, in this lack of connectedness, but also what's your opinion of what we should be doing, you know, in 10 years in terms of strategic goals? Okay. Um, um, I think that um, what should be done is that um, there should be an evaluation of the restoration efforts so far and uh, from the evaluation we could tell the ones that are very very successful or that are pointing towards success and uh, how can that be accelerated if possible or if it can be improved and also looking from the evaluation the weakness of these various efforts and uh, also how to eliminate those issue of concern. So I feel that um, what we should be doing first is to do a, an evaluation of the restoration efforts uh -huh. um, and uh, see how, how things are going and uh, how we can improve on the efforts that have been successful so far to accelerate those efforts and the ones that are not working uh, what is responsible and how to get them to work. I think uh, if we can successfully um, do an evaluation and pinpoint the ones that are working, I think hopefully we can replicate that across the subregion. Uh, mm. But like I said, also we lack um, what I feel is also part of the problem. We lack our um, ski hands. Uh, other than funding, because mm. if we have a lot of ecosystem restoration experts, the science, if the science is in place, I'm very sure that um, scientists also can attract funding to do their own individual or a group restoration efforts. Mm -hmm. So I think that also, other than the evaluation, could also help to accelerate um, ecosystem restoration in the subregion. So the evaluation is the key thing and also try to build capacity of a uh, local scientist towards uh, uh, ecosystem restoration. That is what I feel is what we should be doing. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, Patrick Jasper is asking you, who are the institutions involved into restoration efforts in the region other than regional governments? Are uh, okay. Any private play? Sorry, any private players or technical institutions? And there's one more part. How is the flow of finance for these initiatives? So okay. the players, any private, and then how they're financed. 
Okay, like the African Landscape Restoration Initiative is being uh, the Secretariat is um, is with NEPAD. Um, there is this um, agency for economic uh, development in Africa. It's NEPAD. I can. Okay, that that is the agency where the African Landscape Restoration Initiative have its Secretariat, and mm -hmm. they organize the annual programs. Which I think the fourth one is coming this October um, in one of these um, African countries, the fourth um, um, uh, annual meeting. So NEPAD is the agency that is anchoring the program in Africa. And the funding from NEPAD, I think, is coming from the African Union government and maybe some other regional and international partners. That's for the African Landscape Restoration Project. Why for the Great Green War, although it is um, endorsed and approved by the African Union, uh, but so far I think the effort is coming from national governments. There is no, other than the AU approval, I don't think there is a, a regional body set up um, for the implementation. So each country, like I know, for example, in Nigeria, we have the agency uh, the national agency for the green war so this agency like i said the b was sent in 2015 it was passed by the senate in 2016 and so far there is no news if the president the, the has signed the b so that is the effort at the nigerian level so for other countries perhaps some other efforts uh, may be at play but we can't really say there is a strong organized regional body leading the, the, the restoration efforts of the Green World. Great, thank you. Thank you. You mentioned the need for standards for restoration and I wondered whether you think the standards recently released, if you're aware of them, by yes. the Society for Ecological Restoration Yes, can play a role. And while you're thinking of a response, I see we have Arlene Hopkins on um, in our participant list, and I wondered if she also wanted to make a comment when you're done about standards for restoration. Okay, uh, I'm aware of the recent standard um, fashion too, if we can call it that, uh, released by the Society for Ecological Restoration. Of course, those standards can play a great role if uh, if applied in the region uh, to a very good extent. Um, but other than the global standards, we also need to look at how to develop um, regional standards, maybe mirroring the global standard into restoration practice. But the, the global standard can act as the, the platform or the base where we can uh, accelerate or improve on restoration initiative and practice in the sub-region. I don't know if that uh, answered the No, question. no, it did answer my question. And one of the things the society has been discussing is having uh, sort of appendices to the international principles and standards that would be for different biomes, ecosystem okay. types, or okay. regions. And I, you know, we have assembled here a group, an international group from different group. countries. Okay. But if anybody is interested in that, I would encourage you to communicate with the society. Okay. So let's see. We don't have, we, we have uh, folks who are not sending questions, although I know some people on the phone, or sorry, on the uh, webinar may have some. So this is your last chance to ask Abraham a question. Yeah, I had a, a follow-up question, uh, Abraham, and it was kind of off of what Patrick was asking. I've seen a lot of private sector, um, different consulting firms of the like kind of popping up and um, uh, taking a, a role in, in a lot of things. So I was 
curious. Uh, I didn't know if you had answered that part of that question. Have you seen any um, restoration-minded private sector companies popping up in your area to uh, kind of take the role that you know maybe some of these government initiatives going from con concept to implementation? Have you seen uh, an increase in that in your area? Okay, um, I think um, as part of um, the African uh, landscape, um, forest landscape restoration, I think um, about two years ago, there is a, a kind of a, an idea, restoration accelerated program effort that was put up. But um, from what I could gather from that information, it's outside the region. I think it's uh, basically in South Africa, if I'm correct. Mm. It's a kind of a, a startup venture uh, by some persons in, in Africa towards a, a ecosystem restoration. But the little information I could gather, it's based in South Africa. Why for the West African region, I'm not so sure if they are private efforts towards a restoration. Although sometimes uh, multinational companies can make announcement that of course, um, within so, so so time frame, they'll make efforts towards restoration, you know, as a result of climate change issue or moving to sustainability. But most time it's just a corporate or political statement and uh, it's not back up with uh, any efforts on the ground. So, so far, I don't really think they are private uh, efforts towards um, restoration in the region. You know, I also noticed from your presentation, you were talking about um, sort of mobilizing the, uh, the younger generations to get involved. Um, yes. And some of the things that you saw is uh, uh, there wasn't as much of a connection to some of the international societies. Um, so, um, you know, the IUCN is one of those ones, there's no dues, it's a voluntary thing. And yeah, please uh, feel free to uh, uh, spread the word for uh, the uh, Ecosystem, uh, Commission on Ecosystem Management of the IUCN uh, to any of your um, students or any, some of the youthful populations to kind of create that tether to some of the international sort of initiatives that are going on and to get plugged in. Um, they have a youth, um, a young professionals network also within the CEM that is growing. Um, so, you know, I was just thinking it, it might be a, a great way. Um, if anybody has any questions on getting involved, uh, please feel free to send my email around. And just building on that, um, at the World Conservation Congress, which is IUCN's every four year gathering, the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group is sponsoring an event, we think, we put in a proposal we'll hear soon, in which we're gonna need eight young professionals to assist with. And all of you as well are invited to attend. It's basically focused on the post-2020 agenda and UN decade and how to strategize priority actions to achieve the most. So we're almost out of time here. But I, um, Arlene in the chat um, said she wanted to follow up, so she's unmuted. Take it away, Arlene. We only have a couple <coughs> minutes. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, who was that that was speaking a moment ago about CEM? I've got some um, window th things here, and I couldn't see who was speaking. Oh, uh, that, that was me and Brock. First Brock, oh. then me. Kara. Okay, well, Sorry. I want to second what you folks said and Brock. Yes, if folks are interested, please do get involved. And excuse me, I have a, a little bit of a cough. <coughs> so yeah, do get involved with CEM and IUCN. And within that, there are many, many interesting groups. Um, so what I wanted to do is chime in on um, the notion of folks getting involved. And I think your question, Kara, was about standards. I have been, tr I'm a, actually a member of a group called the American Evaluation Association, AEA, and their website is eval.org, E-V-A-L.org. And within that, there is a subgroup called something like Environmental Program Evaluators. And I've been in that group since it was founded by um, a fellow at the EPA maybe 20 years ago. Long story short, this is a huge issue. 
because there are guidelines and there are principles, but there are no specific um, standards that, um, so far as I'm aware, that can be applied universally. It seems to be in general that we need, um, there's, this, there's an empirical basis which has to do with um, understanding the local ecology <clears throat> and then adaptively manage, managing to restore uh, the ecosystems in, in an artful way. So it has an empirical basis with an artful approach to adaptive management. And often folks now are looking toward traditional ecological knowledge that would have been associated with indigenous people living in that specific locale. Um, being mindful, however, that those traditions may be further modified by climate change. So it's an open question. It's a very interesting and very important question. And um, <clears throat> there's a lot out there. So. Brock and Kara, maybe that could be um, a subject of a future webinar. We could talk about some yeah. of the uh, emerging um, ideas on how do we come up with standards? How do we come up with protocols that yes. have a generic uh, and general quality, but also can be locally adapted? That's a great comment um, to end this session on. And hopefully folks are aware that IUCN is working on developing standards for nature-based solutions. Yes, the yes. The deadline has passed now to comment, although if anyone is interested in, in commenting and, you know, didn't hear about it before the deadline or didn't have a chance to put comments in, you could email me. I'll put my email in the chat here so it's easily accessible and I can connect you. What has been less advertised is there's also an effort to create standards for rewilding. Yes. And um, so I think this issue of standards and also how to approach the UN decade when there's multiple standards by different groups. So, <laughs> so I love the idea of having that as uh, one of our sessions for next year. We're now past time. So I'll just say in addition to the uh, November hello. session, we also in December have a discussion format session. So hopefully um, you guys will be able to participate in these next upcoming sessions as well. Okay, P please Kara, can I just make it one statement? Oh yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I forgot to mention, I'm sorry, uh, the IUCN is very, very much involved in, uh, in supporting uh, some of this restoration initiative. I'm sorry that uh, it skips my mind and during my presentation, I did make mention of that. I know the how you see an organized series of forums and their programs uh, to drive some of these uh, restoration initiatives in the region. I think uh, I should make mention of that before we close this session. Great, thank you so much, Abraham. And that was such a fantastic presentation. We really thank appreciate it. Thank you very much.